Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, fellows and guests, and welcome to this meeting. Um, I'm the president, uh, David Caldwell, and it's uh, a great pleasure to have uh, Derek Hall as our speaker tonight. But before we introduce uh, Derek, can I call on our uh, director, Simon Gilmer, to read the minutes of our AGM. You'll be glad to know that these are very brief minutes of the AGM. Minutes of the annual general meeting of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland held at 4.30 p.m. in the Augustine Church, George IV Bridge, Edinburgh, on Saturday, 30th November 2019. David Caldwell, President of the Society, in the chair. The minutes of the last meeting were read and approved. The Treasurer's Report and Director's Report were read and approved. The motion for voting using digital ballot was agreed. The motion for early career fellowship membership type was agreed. The ballot for new council members was completed and all elected. The ballot for new fellows was completed and all elected. And the ballot for honorary fellows was completed and all elected. The President's address was presented. The following communication was read. Herberno Scandinavian Strap Fittings from Scotland by Caroline Patterson and Craig Stanford, followed by a drinks reception. Thank you very much, Simon. Is that a correct and full record of the meeting? Splendid. I'll take that as a yes, OK? Right, OK. And do we have any other business? Business? No. No. Right. OK. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to welcome um, Derek Hall tonight. Um, archaeologist and ceramic specialist, he describes himself as. But Derek, I think, is rather more than that. Um, he's worked in Scotland and Scottish medieval archaeology for a great number of years at the, at the, at the cutting face, if you like, in all sorts of area. Uh, a lot of the time he was employed uh, in archaeology, in archaeological units in Perth. He did a spell uh, working for, uh, as a, an inspector of ancient monuments. And over the years, he has uh, required quite a justified um, reputation internationally as a medieval archaeologist and particularly as a ceramics expert. But tonight, he's going to speak to us about excavations he's been undertaking uh, outside Perth. I'm frankly not sure what the title means. But uh, no doubt uh, Derek is about to explain. So, Derek. Thank you, David. Good evening, everybody. OK, I'll explain it. Um, it's always struck me as, as interesting that in Lindsay's three estates, the only friary that he refers to in Scotland um, are the Carmelites at Tully Lum. Um, I'll say more about Tullylum in a minute. Um, there is a, a character, it's Deceit, um, is walking along the road um, from either Keneal or Canool when he finds a piece of clothing um, on the road which he picks up and displays and he says, here is a cowl of Tullylum. So that explains the title. Um, interestingly, in the next verse, um, the character then goes on to tell his daughter that she will be married to a friar of Tully Lum um, in months to come. Um, but don't worry, it's because you're deaf and dumb. So I think that's the giveaway. Lindsay liked Tully Lum because it rhymes. Now, um, some background. By 1460, uh, sorry, by 1429, um, Perth has four monastic houses. Three of these are friaries. Um, we have the Dominicans at Blackfriars in 1231. Um, we then have the Carmelites that I'm speaking about tonight um, at Tully Lum, which is quite a long way away from town, um, at W there uh, on the aerial photograph. But it is beside the main western medieval routeway into the borough. Um, we then have the Greyfriars, the Franciscans, who are down at Greyfriars Cemetery, uh, G, uh, on the AP. And we have the only Carthusian house uh, in Scotland, founded in 1429. Um, the Carthusians, remember, they're not friars, they're monks. They have individual cells, um, so you can't really count them as being of a similar um, style to the others. But 
it is interesting um, that there is enough going on in Perth um, to bring these orders there to found houses. My relationship with this site um, really begins back in 1982 um, when I came to Perth um, to run a manpower services scheme, um, which, along with Alan Radley, we supervised um, excavations in advance of new industrial units by the Scottish Development Agency. Um, they were building some new light industrial units. Now, where they was, these were being built, um, opposite Wells Hill Cemetery on the Genefield Road, this was known to be the vicinity um, of the Carmelite Friary, but nobody was quite sure exactly um, where it was located. So, along with Jonathan Wordsworth, um, we carried out some trial excavation of quite a large development area, and because we were picking up um, a lot of building foundations, human bone, window glass, um, at the western end of the site, next door to what was then um, Paxton's The Joiners, um, you can see part of his building there at the top right of, of, of the slide. Um, we concentrated on that area for eight weeks um, and ended up finding what um, I have interpreted as being the eastern end of the Friary Church, um, possibly the sacristy, um, and one part of the East Range dormitory block of the Friary. Probably one of the most interesting finds from that excavation is this, um, which is a pewter seal matrix. Now that's back to front, um, but when it's impressed on wax, it says S. Prioris Fratrum Carmel de Pert, the seal of the prior and brothers of the Carmelites of Perth. And because um, the Virgin Mary is shown breastfeeding baby Jesus, um, John Sherry at the time uh, told me that he was fairly happy that that's 13th century. Um, so it may well be the original seal matrix of the friary. Um, also, look, you can tell it's 1982. Health and safety, um, sorry. High vis, fencing, uh, those were the days. Now, in um, 2008, I happened to be reading the planning applications for Perth um, and spotted that somebody had put in a planning application to redevelop um, the rest of the site to the west of where we dug in 1982, um, which, as far as I was concerned, um, was going to be where the rest of the friary was. Um, so um, off the bat, I just phoned up the architect and said, I think we ought to have a chat about this. Um, just so you know what you're dealing with. Um, and I pointed out to him that, okay, they're building light industrial units, but unless they come up with a sensible foundation design, all of the archaeology on that site would need to be dealt with. Um, and we certainly could be talking about an awful lot. Anyway, in a nutshell, um, we ended up starting um, an excavation when I was still at SUAT, um, Scottish Urban Archaeological Trust, again for eight weeks, um, with a team of six. And we were told by the developer um, that he didn't want us to take the spoil off site, um, so he wanted us to dig the, the footprints of, of his new building uh, in two bits. So we were to dig one bit, finish that, move the spoil heap, and dig the second bit. Um, needless to say, we only really got started on the first bit, um, which was up here, um, over the rest of the church, and the northern end of the cloister. Um, by the end of our seventh or eighth week, um, we'd lifted 102 burials um, from the church, all from inside the building. Um, these are burials inside the church. It's important to stress that. They're not from the graveyard. One Friday afternoon, um, my mobile phone rang, um, and that was the developer telling me that he would like us to stop, please. Um, it was about the time of the uh, credit crunch. Um, he could see how much money um, this was costing him. So he decided he would rather take a while and think about things. Um, so we stopped, we packed up, and we laid geotextile over the archaeology and backfilled the site with a spoil heap and went away. Um, for six years... 
uh, nothing happened apart from the gypsies taking over the site. Um, and then I got an email from the developer saying that he felt it was time for him to start back on site, um, but could we have a meeting to discuss this? Um, I said, yeah, of course. So we did. We had a coffee. Um, and he said, yeah, um, let's get back on site. I know I've got to deal with all the archaeology before I start building, but, I mean, there's not that much left anyway. So, um, you know, it's not going to take that long. Um, and um, do you mind just doing it by yourself? Because... Um, I'm not in a great hurry, um, and as long as you're known to be chipping away in the background, um, I'll be perfectly happy. So I said, well, okay. Um, two things. Um, firstly, we need to talk to the local authority archaeologists to make sure they're happy with one man uh, working on a site of this size, uh, health and safety issues, etc., etc. Uh, and number two, um, you need to be paying my invoices on a regular basis. Um, so... Um, just before I move on to the next slide, this is what we got in 82, and the rest of the site um, is essentially the rest um, of the complex. So, come July 1984, um, I'm back on site with a HIMAC um, and my son Fergus um, to begin taking the soil off the geotextile. Needless to say, that's put him off archaeology for life. Uh, <laughs> I did explain to him that it wasn't like that all the time, um, but he wasn't having any of it. Um, so, July 2014, um, things were opened up again. Now, I've got an awful lot to cram into a very short period of time, so what I'll do um, is summarise um, what I think we're dealing with here, because I've got quite a long way on with the post-excavation. There's an important point to make here, the Carmelite Friary, although it was founded in 1262, from at least the early 14th century, has a very strong involvement with the Bishop of Dunkeld. And in fact, the bishops move down and take the friary over as their headquarters um, until the early 15th century. As you'll see, that has quite a big effect um, on not just the buildings, um, but the sort of burial archaeology that we're dealing with. Um, interestingly, what you're looking at here are the upstanding remains of the 13th century church. This is its west end. And you can see there are these rather nice cut ashlar blocks. And on them are two mason's marks, the top one of which was also found um, by Suat on the stone bridge that crosses the Lade into the Blackfriars Monastery. So we're obviously dealing with the same masons uh, being employed for different religious houses. The main thing that the bishop does is to completely rebuild the church and extend it by five metres um, to the west. So what you're looking at here, the green is the Carmelite phase, the red is the bishop's rebuild. Curiously, when he rebuilds, the church, he doesn't rebuild it on the existing foundations. It's rebuilt adjacent to existing foundations. The only reason I can think for that is that that original building is in such a bad state of repair that they build the new one around it and take the old one down um, as they go along. Now, I said to you we had 102 burials in 2008. Um, by the time I finished with the church, there were another 204, so that's 306. There are some very peculiar burial practices going on here that I want to talk to you about. Firstly, um, 16 of the burials in the church are buried with these long pieces of green wood. It's, they're very thin. Um, it looks like they've been cut on the day of burial. They've still got bark on them, and it's been laid next to the body. They look like staffs, but they're not thick enough to function as that. I think they're symbolic. Um, symbolic of what? We'll get onto that in a minute. So that's 16 with these long, thin bits of green wood. There are another eight who have much shorter rods buried with them. 
Again, this is green wood, um, and consistently they're beside the body from just below the pelvis, um, down one side. In one curious example here, there's a bundle um, of about five or six of these wooden rods beside the body, and this female burial here has crossed branches um, on her chest. Now, recently I have been doing a lot of work trying to find parallels um, for this burial practice, and, and this is quite interesting. Um, there are good parallels from Scandinavia, um, from Lund, from Trondheim, um, from Oslo. There are also good parallels from England. Um, interestingly enough, most of the English ones are from monastic houses. Most of the Scandinavian ones are from churches or church graveyards, not monastic houses. And in Scotland, um, we don't really have good parallels for wooden staffs, but from St Giles in Edinburgh and St Nicholas in Aberdeen, there are these short wooden rods. The ones from St Giles um, have been interpreted as being um, some sort of baton of status, maybe, or, or something like that. The long staffs, this is interesting, because if you look in, in Scandinavia, um, one of the accepted theories there is that they're to do with measuring. They're to do with when the grave is being measured, when the burial is being put in, and the staff is then put in with the body. The other possibility that Roberta Gilchrist discusses is that it's a reference to the Bible. You are my staff, you are my rod. Another possibility is the pilgrim's staffs. Now, remember what I'm saying to you. The ones from Whitefriars, um, this is probably one of the best examples here, they're too thin to be functional. I think they're symbolic. Now, here's a theory that I'm beginning to work on at the moment. What if these burials are using a tradition that is harking back to a family origin? What if it's possible the burials in that church with wooden staffs have Scandinavian forebears? Now, that's only something I'm working on at the moment. But as you can understand, um, it's quite easy to come up with lots of different theories um, about a practice like that. Um, and on here, good parallels from Trondheim for the wooden staffs. Um, these are the, some of the ones from Lund. In passing, this one is from Sandwell Abbey, uh, Sandwell Priory in England, and that, as you can see, is a much thicker staff. That's much more functional um, than my ones from Whitefriars. So, staffs and rods. What else have we got? There are two burials from the church where bits of the body are missing, and instead you have a piece of wood. I'm not saying that these are wooden arms or legs. All they are are bits of wood that are where a, bon a bone should be, like a missing radius um, or something like that. Uh, and no, I haven't found any parallels for that at all at the moment. Um, and a disarticulated skull with an eye patch um, still in situ, uh, but no strap for it. Um, shoes. Um, two of the burials from the church are buried with the shoes on. Um, when I say shoes, this example here, which is in the chancel, um, has shoe soles on its feet, um, and they're from different shoes. Uh, there are no uppers to the shoes. There are just leather straps. I think these are supposed to look like sandals. So I think there's a bit of symbolism uh, going on here again. Um, the other leather uh, footwear on this burial are more like uh, boots. They didn't survive as well, but I could see the leather was coming much further um, up the legs. Um, another burial in the chancel has these very peculiar objects buried above its right elbow. Um, that's them there in situ um, in the burial. This is what they look like when they've been lifted. And as you can see from the scale, they're tiny. Um, now, I still have to get these analysed 
Um, but I have wondered all along if this might actually be wax. There have been burials um, in England where there are fake objects made of wax, like this chalice um, from Holton Abbey in Staffordshire. Could these be supposed to be some sort of representation of a bishop, bishop's crozier? Um, but they, they're very small. Um, so I have no solution for that at all uh, at the moment. Um, all of the burials um, from the church, needless to say, are Christian burials. But here we have a female burial who is buried above another burial who is buried under a Caithness roof slate. The friary is re-roofed with Caithness slates in 1517. So can we argue that this female burial is post that date, maybe? Early 16th century? To test that, um, I've just had the body carbon dated, and that's the carbon date that comes back. Um, so the top end of that will be um, in the 15. 20, that sort of area. These um, are jet beads and one single yellow glass one. Um, I found these five yet jet beads and the single glass one in the excavation when the burial was being washed in Aberdeen University, which is where all the skeletons are at the moment. They found another three jet beads. So we have a total of eight jet beads, one glass bead. But Gita Hoffman, who is doing the report on these for me, thinks that this originated as a rosary and it's been repurposed as a necklace um, and put around the, the neck of the burial. Also, there is a group of these tiny uh, beads, which Birgitta thinks probably are glass, um, and she thinks they're probably from a brocade um, at the front of quite an ornate ornate dress. So that's quite a high status burial um, in the church early 16th century I think um, by the looks of things. Um, now back in 1982 um, when we dug the eastern end of the church we got um, three or four burials right in front of where the altar will have been that were in wood lined graves. These are not coffins you can't carry these with bodies in. The grave is dug, it's lined with wood, and then the body is put in. Except in one of those examples, it's not a full burial as such that's been put into the grave. It's bits of a body. So that's translated bone, presumably that's come from somewhere else. In my more recent excavations, underneath the south wall of the rebuilt church... There is another uh, wood-lined grave. You can see the sideboards and the planks on the bottom. Inside it, there are more translated bones that have been laid out to look like a burial. The reason I knew that it was wrong is because the joints at the top of the leg bones are facing out, and anatomically that just does not work. Um, so somebody's tried to make it look like a body. Um, and hasn't quite succeeded. Um, I think these may originate from what was formerly a mural tomb in the north wall of the church over here, um, and that when the church is being remodelled, I think that's being dis disassembled and the bones are being moved and reburied in this new uh, grave under the church. Um, I was busy digging at the western end of the extended church and I was spending weeks on what I thought was quite a big square pit, uh, having trouble finding a good edge to it. And then um, in about the second week, I began to find timber and I thought, right, there's another wood-lined grave in here, expecting it to be six feet long, two feet wide. It's two and a half metres square um, with what I think is um, some sort of fixture to enable you to open it again, should you so wish. Inside it, there were three uh, burials. Quite a tall adult 
in the middle, who was so tall that his feet were actually sticking out the end of the grave, um, so there's no sideboard in here, because they got their dimensions wrong. Um, on either side of him um, are two younger burials, one of whom has a wooden staff. Um, so that's probably the latest example um, of that burial practice. And the adult in the middle has an iron bracelet um, on his wrist. They are in a very peculiar location right at the western end of the extended church, but I do wonder if they've been buried there because this is where a new altar of the Holy Blood um, was built in around about 1515, um, looking at the Dunkeld rental book. These three people were all buried at the same time. It's a single event, um, and presumably they may well be related. Um, so far, um, I've not been able to find any parallels for a woodlion grave or even a, a burial plot um, of this size anywhere. Um, and when the burials are lifted, we have the planks lining the base um, of the grave, and all of this wood is reused. Um, you can see the nail holes, and that may be a bolt hole or something in there. I think this timber originates from the early church, and again, when it's being remodelled, they're reusing the wood um, to line that grave. Um, and as you can see over here, I have parallels for the single wood line graves. Um, we were getting them from St Giles in Edinburgh in 1981, um, and I have seen a reference to something that's called a ladder grave from the Reba Dom Kirk, which I think, again, is one of these um, single woodlined graves. Um, it's interesting because I can see, when I'm looking at my stratigraphy, that although there are burials that relate to the earliest phase of the Carmelite church, when the church is extended, there is a sudden explosion in burial. Everybody seems to suddenly want to get buried in this church, presumably to be associated with the bishop. Um, and as you can see, they're even putting in burials over um, the previous wall lines of the early phases of the church, um, which can't have been much fun um, digging that grave. And here, just running out of the site, um, we have what I think is a tomb with at least three uh, burials inside it which is cut through an earlier grave that you can see part of there. Now, to the west of the church, um, in the early phases, um, I defined this quite large area um, of low temperature burning. There's quite deep charcoal. Um, there's a whole range of ovens, um, a potential furnace where you can see the side of it has been burnt red uh, with the heat. And again, something that is just running out of the site, which is a flue for another oven out this way, which has a reused base of a medieval pot um, beside the entrance to the flue, which presumably is being used to hold water, but it's been thrown into the oven. I think it's a bread oven. Um, there are two possibilities here. This is either welfare facilities for the people building the Carmelite church back in 1262, or it could even be um, early cooking activities associated with the first phrase of the West Range, which runs down to the south from this point. Um, curiously, some of the hearths associated with that charcoal are very small. Um, these are almost like one-person hearths. Um, so, I mean, you can almost regard them as being where someone is cooking their dinner um, at one point. Um, so I still have a bit of untangling to do with the stratigraphy in that area, but, but that's quite interesting that that's going on there. Um, when we look at the western end of the church, um, when I had that properly defined, I spotted that there were wider foundations under the well-built um, end of the church. These foundations are slightly wider spread. They're on a different alignment to the wall above, and one of the stones has an incised cross on it, 
Um, and this looks like a buttress, which has absolutely nothing to do with that building sitting above. I think this is very tenuous evidence for what might be a church that's already on that site when the Carmelites arrive in 1262, which fits quite nicely with something that Geoffrey Barrow pointed out back in 1982, that there are references to the place of Tully Lum as early as 1157. Um, and he says that these do seem to be references to church lands um, possibly belonging to Dunfermline Abbey at one point in its life. Um, so there are early things going on here. And this, so far, is the only evidence that I've able to pick up uh, of what may be an early church on the site. Um, the charcoal and the oven then have a metal path built over them, which is bringing access into the friary complex from the west. There is a courtyard built outside the western end of the church, which has this stone-packed socket in it. And I wonder if this might have held a freestanding cross um, just outside the church to the west, maybe some sort of preaching cross. Then um, we have the very battered remains of the cloister and its arcades. Um, we're only looking here at very much the base foundations um, of the cloister arcade, um, which originally will have had a line of arches um, running along it, rather like you can see here um, on this friary at Ennis, uh, County Clare in Ireland. Um, and we have good evidence for the surviving arcade walks as well. Um, so, as you can see, um, having finished the church, um, I then had to begin to move south um, and look at the ranges and the cloister. Um, the West Range um, is one that I started on. It was at this point that the cavalry arrived, um, and I had two people from older archaeology for two or three months, um, which meant I was able to stay finishing off the church, and I just stuck them in the range and said, there, it's all yours. Um, and they got stuck into that. And the range had been very badly robbed. That's to say none of the stone foundations for the walls survived at all. There were just long, deep rubber trenches where somebody has come along and taken all the stone out uh, to take it away and reuse it somewhere um, in the vicinity. Inside that building, um, at least two or three sequences of mortar and green sandstone floors, um, and what may be the very badly damaged remains of an internal water supply uh, with a channel running down here. Um, then there is a pathway coming in to this end of the friary complex, and we pick up the beginning of the south range, which runs over this way. And in the western end, um, which is where I started to begin with, we have a sequence of drains. One of them is feeding in from the cloister. The other two are running up to wall faces. So I think they're taking waste from the floor above. Um, the west range is where probably at first floor level that would have been the dining area. Um, so the waste is being taken down and then out through these drains, um, out through the wall, and presumably into some sort of ditch um, out, out that way, which I, I haven't found. Um, in the south wall um, of the south range, in its first phase, there is a doorway um, which provides access to a courtyard um, which is built of very rough stones. On that courtyard, there are about five layers of oyster shell um, somebody is coming out of this door with a bucket full of oyster shells and throwing them out onto the courtyard and you get this big curve of waste um, cleanliness is next to godliness not in this situation um, that must be their staple diet I think uh, oysters so that's phase one when you've got a doorway um, also there's a rubbish pit in the courtyard um, which has the remains of a perennial brooch that's lost uh, sorry, annular brooch that's lost its pin. Um, um, in here, there was quite a lot of animal bone. 
And there was one single piece of human bone, a pelvis. Um, presumably there must have been quite a lot of that knocking around this place, which is being swept up and put into pits. Um, and beside that, there is this rather curious stone-lined tank. It's not very big. Um, I'm still racking my brains as to what you might use this for. Maybe it's where you stored your oysters before you took them into the ferry. But to be honest, you wouldn't be able to get that many in there. Um, still looking for parallels for that. Um, in the second phase of that south range, they block the doorway and they dismantle the doorway and they then bury it in a pit directly outside the building. They don't take the stone away to reuse it elsewhere. So outside the building, you have all of the um, arch fragments from the doorway, like this one here, the side stones um, of the doorway. And the lintel is buried here um, in another pit uh, inside the building. Um, that seems terribly lazy, but then again, maybe it's just as easy to dig a big hole and bury it and just forget about it. Um, then <clears throat> we have the South Range carrying on um, to the east. Um, this is up to the limit um, of the development area here where that chain dot line is. Um, and um, I picked up evidence for internal room divisions in that building, which presumably have held upright timber posts. There was an awful lot of burnt clay daub coming out of those, so... I'm pretty happy that they were timber um, originally. There is a doorway leading out into the cloister and from the occupation levels, a complete brooch this time with the pin um, still in place. Um, when the remodelling of the Frari is taking place, probably in the early 16th century when, it's, when the church is rebuilt, a water supply is then provided for it. There must have been one for the friars, but I mean, presumably we're just looking at a well or something like that. This is a proper water supply. You have um, a ditch running into site here, which originally um, has had a lead pipe in it. Um, the base is clay lined, and you can see where the lead pipe has been taken out. Um, from the associated pottery, this rather nice... Um, German rare and stoneware, um, which is 16th century. Um, so that, that ties in with the, the remodeling um, of the building. Then the water supply runs down um, beside the front of the West Range and down towards the South Range. When it enters the South Range, it changes and becomes a wooden trough in the floor. That is a wooden tree trunk um, that has been cut down, and then one side of it has been shaped like that. So you're left with a wooden trough in the floor, which presumably you can um, supply with the water um, as and when is needed. To confirm the date of that, um, I got a carbon date for this juvenile burial here that is cut by that water supply. And the date I've got for that burial is that, which means the insertion of the water supply is post that date and must relate to the bishop's remodelling um, of the friary. Um, then, um, just above natural now, I'm getting good evidence for the levelling of the site prior to constru construction, um, the building up of, of bits of it, the erection of the buildings. Um, these, I think, are scaffold post holes, um, for when uh, the South Range is being erected. And the water supply, when it's inserted, is taking water from up here on Wells Hill, which stands about maybe 10 metres higher than the Friary. So gravity is being used to bring water down um, into here and then down through the complex into the South Range. It then feeds into those drains that I've already shown you, so they're being flushed out using that water supply. And there's a main drain running off it, heading down here, 
to where I think the rear adorter or what toilet block will have been, which is exactly where my site toilet was. Uh, fate, a funny thing. Um, and right against the southern limit of the excavation um, and the development area, there is the edge of the southern precinct boundary um, for the friary. So the friary is concentrated um, in that area and has at least one precinct ditch down there. Now, <clears throat> as you can imagine, on a site like this where you're dealing with a church where there's been fairly intensive burial, um, trying to understand any surviving internal features um, is a nightmare. But I have what I think is the foundations for the chancel arch um, of the Carmelite church, the 13th century church, um, just surviving at foundation level, um, originally probably looking something like this. And there is a single stone at the end of one of these walls, which I think has the remains um, of a column base in it. Um, when the church is remodeled and extended, that division goes out of use and a new division is built across the church. This time it's a timber um, division. There's a long trench dug that will have held upright timber posts. It's stone packed to hold up those timber posts. One of the bits of stone used for packing is from one of these. It's the leg of chain mail from a tomb effigy. I wonder again if this might have come from that mural tomb that I showed you earlier, but it does seem rather curious that they're smashing up a tomb effigy um, when the church is being remodelled. Uh, maybe somebody got into a bit of trouble for doing that. Um, and right at the point where that boundary meets the southern wall of the church, rather than being a stone that's used for packing, it's a section of human leg bone. Uh, now, as regards any evidence for what the interior surfaces of the church were like, um, there's only three floor tiles from the whole site, so I don't think there's any real evidence that large areas of it were tiled. We're dealing with mortar floors, um, and maybe about three or four centimetres thick, that are just being spread. Um, and then when graves are being dug through those mortar floors and filled in, the mortar floor is then being relayed on top. Uh, and that's happening um, several times, as you can see from that section through the backfill of the grave. Um, and here we have one patch um, of surviving white mortar surface. Now, that's quite interesting because these churches will have been quite dark places. I mean, they had stained glass windows, but that doesn't let in that much light. So reflected candlelight will have an awful lot to do with the amount of light in that building. If you've got a white floor, I would suggest that that increases uh, the amount of light that's available. Um, now, when we come to the Reformation of 1559, um, you all know John Knox um, preaches in St. John's Church in Perth. Um, the rascal multitude then runs out, uh, kicks out the friars, and flattens all the friaries um, over a couple of days. Now, there is still quite a lot of debate um, as to how feasible it was for it to be done that quickly. But can I say to you that my evidence for the robbing of the ranges, certainly the, the South Range, is that most of that is being done in the medieval period. This is a late medieval stone robbing that's going on here. Um, they're leaving steps in the wall line so they can carry bits of stone out. And from the backfill, there is this rather nice uh, base and stem from a soda glass, wine glass like this one, um, which I'm told is of 16th century date. Um, so... Good evidence for the robbing of the ranges being of late medieval date, and I would quite happily see that as happening around about the Reformation. Although, interestingly, Whitefriars are never mentioned um, in any of the descriptions of that action. It's always Blackfriars or the Carthusians. They forget about Whitefriars. Um, but then again, they were quite a long way 
out. Um, so, this is pretty much what I'm looking at at the moment as regards my phasing. You have your first phase, 13th century Carmelite friary, um, with its initial uh, either welfare facilities or uh, cooking activities for the West Range, then the laying of all the walkways, courtyards, precinct line down here. Then, when the whole complex or the church anyway is remodelled, the church is pushed out another five metres to the west, water supply is put in, the west range is pushed up about three metres against the church, so the access point there is blocked, um, and we have our whole sequence of drains, and I think there is a new precinct boundary just slightly further in um, from where that ditch was. Now, in 2018, a new planning application was submitted for this site, still to build industrial units, but on a slightly different footprint. Um, they were going to be slightly bigger um, at the top end of the site, and there wasn't going to be any building at all on uh, the southwestern corner. So um, the local authority said to the developer, um, you need to get that bit looked at um, before we can decide what's going to happen next. So I was there for another two weeks, um, and I found um, the north wall of the south range. I found the continuation of that main drain uh, water supply running up to the north wall of the south range and then running along it towards where I think the rear daughter is. Uh, down there. The important thing is no more burials because I think there was the worry that there might be some burials in the cloister because often there will be uh, in these establishments but not in this case. Um, I'll say more about this in a minute but that begs the question where's the graveyard because um, I still haven't found it. Um, fines. Julie Franklin at Headland is currently working on my fines for me um, they're not wildly exciting, but I think they do give quite a nice range of the different activities that are taking place in the friary. Um, these x-rays of the metalwork, um, we have some nice keys, um, some scissors, some brooches, um, some Jews harps. Um, so the friars were able to have a little bit of musical accompaniment, um, which is always nice to know. Um, belt fittings. And... Rather nicely, um, from stratified levels within the church, there are eight coins. So that's going to help um, my phasing. Uh, they have yet to be looked at. Um, it had to happen. Yes, there's quite a lot of pottery from this site. Um, lots of the local wares, some interesting vessel types, but I think my favourite section of the pottery are these late... German stonewares that are all coming from the remodelled church, so we're looking at the 16th century, and from quite a big shell midden in the cloister, we have fragments of what I think is an alberello, um, which could well be North Italian, um, that's 16th century as well. So all this nice pottery is relating to when the bishop is actually there at the friary. Um, Beyond that, we have part of a black marble altar stone with a cross, um, which came out of the demolition material in the church. And there is quite a bit of sculpted stone from the site, but most of it is, is fairly uh, boring. But this rather nice uh, sculpted panel comes from very close to the end of the site where those three people have been buried in that big wood-lined grave. I wonder if this might be some sort of memorial panel off the wall of the church um, at that point. Um, environmental analysis. AOC have done um, a really good environmental report for me recently, and interestingly, from those layers of charcoal that I was telling you about, there are grape seeds. Now, does this mean that they might have been growing grapes uh, in the vicinity of the friary? I mean, wine is something that's needed um, for quite a lot of the rituals in the church. Um, 
With climactic variation, um, it's not impossible. You might have been able to do that um, way back then. And in fact, the slope that they're using to bring the water down is running up quite nicely and, and faces southeast. So it's not possible. I can see I haven't convinced you. Um, maybe they're from raisins then. How boring is that? Um, but interesting that they should be there. And my favourite bit of the animal bone report there are hundreds of frog bones in those drain fills um, identified for me by Catherine Smith. So, um, post-excavation. Um, do we have enough evidence to reconstruct the friary complex and its buildings? I think we do. Um, nice evidence for what the roof slates look like on the building, including slates that have been fitted around things, uh, columns uh, on the church. Um, Ceramic ridge tiles um, for one of the ranges. Lots of window glass um, from the friary. Most of it, unfortunately, not surviving as well as that bit. And back in 1982, this roof finial um, from the east end of the friary church with very distinctive fleur-de-lis style decoration um, representing the Holy Trinity, which is exactly like one that AOC found recently um, at Angram Bishop's Palace, uh, which is rather nice. So, yeah, I think we can reconstruct it. If there's a graveyard, where is it? Good question. There's only one bit of this development I've not dug, which is where the car park is to go. Should we run a book as to that's where it is? Um, how early are the bishops of Dunkeld involved with the friary? I think that's quite interesting because the first reference to the bishops of Dunkeld at Whitefriars is when he's being excommunicated in 1363 by the Pope because of an argument that he's having with Cambus Kenneth Abbey who say that he's stealing their cattle. Um, it's enough to get him excommunicated. Um, also, this site at Tully Lum is not in the parish of Perth. It's in Tibbermore. Tibbermore fell within the diocese of Dunkeld. So he's able to come down and take over Whitefriars for that reason, because it's in his diocese. If it had been in Perth, he wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, was there an earlier church on the site? Well, I've got limited evidence for that. Um, the ranges were destroyed in the 1559 Reformation. What about the church? There are vague references to the church being saved by Lord Ruthven, um, but I found it difficult to find any definite proof for that. Um, other things that I'm intending to do, um, you can see that I've had two carbon dates already. I'm waiting for another two. Uh, that was funded by the Hunter Archaeological Trust. I want to try and raise some more money for yet at least another eight carbon dates because if you use these skeletons sensibly, they're very helpful for dating the various phases um, of what's going on in the different buildings. Um, maybe it might be worth trying some DNA analysis at some future point. Aberdeen University, as I've said already, are looking at my uh, burials from 2014 to 2018. They have said to me that DNA is something that might be on offer um, in the near future. The previous um, assemblage was looked at by Edinburgh University. Uh, they looked at the first... Um, 102. And my plan is to publish online uh, next year. Um, that's the plan. But that all depends on what happens with the development because until building work has taken place, that project is not actually finished. In summing up, um, okay, 131 weeks outside. Um, it gives you a very good feel for the climate, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I was frozen off for weeks. Um, I was under snow for weeks. Um, I was closed down for four months because it had rained so much. Um, the water table on that site, very high. Um, so the pump became a very useful extra member of staff. Um, and I have a recommendation. If any of you ever find yourself in this situation, do cultivate your site mascots. They help enormously. Thank you very much.